I'm Kim Delangela. I'm the department chair uh, and director of training for the uh, clinical PsyD program at the Chicago School of Professional Psychology. And I'm joined today by the director of clinical training for our program, Dr. John Chersinski. And today we're going to present to you a, um, some information about a course that we've developed for our program that we really think fits the um, theme of today's conference. Um, that really talks about our social relevance as psychologists and our engagement with communities in a changing practice landscape. Um, first, our school, Chicago School of Professional Psychology, has been very committed to community engagement for our whole history. Our program is the flagship program of the Chicago School, 37 years of educating uh, practitioners with a very strong community engagement. Um, and in our mission, we have a very strong community focus as well as practice focus. So as we were um, considering um, the community needs and we were considering the many uh, challenges uh, that um, the practice landscape was providing for us, um, we saw an increasing importance on um, developing the consultation competencies for the students in our programs in a way that was aligned with our mission. And so um, one of the, so today we're going to talk about how we did that. Um, and we're going to summarize the um, expanding opportunities that our students will have, we believe, um, uh, in their health, as health service psychologists to serve as consultants for organizations that um, need consultation services and represent diverse communities. And we're going to talk about three models of service learning um, that we've developed um, as we've gone through our uh, process. So how did we get to the development of this course? First of all, there, there was, in, it was three prongs, I think. Um, all of us who are in professional education with uh, NCSPP um, are, have been dealing with the consultation competency in different ways over time, right? Some of us have had courses, some of us have attended to it within, um, uh, sort of di distributed across the, the curriculum. We've had lots of ways of doing it or not doing it, but I think we can generally say that we haven't really put an emphasis on that in most of our programs. So. The SOA is helping us with that. Any of you who were uh, at the trainings are, uh, should be very aware that the consultation competency is becoming in a really inc of increasing importance um, in our um, uh, competency assessment. So the SOA helped us to um, about two years ago to start to rethink our curriculum around uh, consultation. And so, the, but the other really powerful thing that has influenced this is um, the changing practice landscape. Um, how many of you know what MACRA is? All right. Um, and we all know what the, um, the, oh, what's now called Obamacare, but the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act. We recognized, um, as we we're looking at, at um, just so you know, that MACRA is um, the new way that, um, I, I don't know if it's new. It's, it's the integration of the quality measures into payment for our services. And this is, uh, any of you who don't know what MACRA is should know that soon. What MACRA um, legislation uh, put in place is that we as clinicians will be required to report on our quality metrics and to run efficient practices um, and serve healthcare institutions that serve efficient practices and interact with business folk and interact with systems that are going to require us to do program evaluation, to do uh, program assessment. Those competencies are going to become of increasing importance um, in our practices, whether we're individual clinicians or whether we're working in large systems these financial incentives, disincentives, and measurement tools. And so we recognized that uh, the Affordable Care Act obviously has all of those in, but it, it, with increasing importance on, on um, understanding the business models, organizational models, and the ability to impact those in meaningful ways, that that was going to be important for us as uh, and for our students as professionals 
and for us as individual practitioners. Um, and so, and the interprofessional practice piece, we all know about that, right? We're all, that's a comp interdisciplinary interprofessional practice is also in the SOA. But we're, we really recognize that that was, um, a dr these were driving forces that were gonna require us to do something different with our students um, going forward. So um, that, was, that was one, that's a professional education um, piece that was driving us to really look at our consultation model. The other thing um, was, as I just talked about, the practice environment. And we know that, we learned from our interns that 72% of our interns are part of interprofessional teams in this past year. Interacting with lots of hospital administrators and, and serving on boards and things like that. 28% are doing case consultation, which we are more familiar with. But a whopping 32% of our interns on, pra on internship this year are involved in doing some kind of program commentary or program consultation or, or some kind of activity that really is about a sys organizational system that they're act asked to interact with and provide comment on. And so that, that really drove home the importance of us working on that. Um, how many of you know of the work of Robin Henderson in Oregon? Um, no? Uh, or Peter Brower in St. Louis. These are psychologists like you and I who now um, occupy extraordinary roles within um, the health um, uh, governance and uh, leadership infrastructure in their states and are making key decisions about how the future of healthcare will be shaped and how the future of our practice will be integrated into the, the, the practice landscape. And, what, and I, when you hear them speak, you really hear them say, please develop these competencies because we as psychologists are able to make very important contributions to the health of our nation by having these competencies in organizational consultation and, and skills to really understand the broad picture and do the evaluations and, and the measurement that we are so good at with our assessment skills. So, so there's an increasing demand within those systems for us to do these things that our interns are just being asked to, to do, and also to, to shape policy and understand those. So that, though, these are the, this is one of the major factors that also led us to the model we're gonna talk about. And then, most importantly, um, is our communities. So we know that state and federal funds are drying up. Right, because, and, and some of this is good uh, because um, the ACA is covering more people and so they're getting their health care not from, from state funded social service agencies but they're getting it from, um, from their health care system, right? It's not, they're, they're not um, left out of the picture. And we'll see what happens now, but, um, but now, right now, um, all social service agencies who used to be the catchment, used to be the safety net for those not covered by insurance, are now seeing fluxes in their, um, their funding sources, and states are low on budgets. So we're seeing the safety net really, I don't know, it's, I don't, I don't wanna say if it's holes or it's collapsing, I don't know what language to use, but we're in this very um, difficult period for the safety nets that we've had for those who've not had access to good health care in our communities through funding. So we, we so, um, and then there's consolidations. In health care, if you've been following this, a lot of agencies who used to do the same thing and have their own private funding sources are now being forced to talk to each other about who provides what in a community because quality metrics and all of those things are being, and accountability for practices are really becoming part of the social service sphere, sphere as well. And we're seeing mergers and acquisitions, for lack of a better word, business terms we're not used to talking about within the social service um, uh, framework. And they, they're not, they really are not sure how to do some of the work um, necessary to, to keep their mission afloat. Um, so, and then, so what do people, what do businesses, what do, do um, you know, profitable businesses do when they have a, a problem and they see a change in the landscape? They call a consultant, right? An organizational consultant. They call someone with expertise in business things, in finance, they have some people come in. Our not-for-profits, who are that safety net, don't have those resources to do that. Um, and so I was talking to John, um, and he said that one of the agencies that we uh, have been doing some work with, they, um, they, 
to do some of the basic work, $75,000 or $10,000. If you, any of you work with community agencies, you know they don't have that. And, and, they, and often, more often than not, they do not have the expertise in-house to, to uh, analyze and, and talk about, to figure out what, how to go forward in a very rapidly changing, complicated um, environment. So here comes us, right? Um, so we decided that we were going to do a, co a course that, um, that would um, address some of these needs and be in align, and aligned with our mission as an institution to serve our communities and train psychologists. So this is, we have a, the, the description of it doesn't even capture what we're doing. We'll go, go a little bit further into this. Supervision, consultation, and professional practice. A, aspirational course, it includes a lot of things, but we decided to make as the center of this um, the consultation model, um, a, a consultation. So, we, um, we use, these are the texts we use, okay, and so they're not, not standard clinical psychology texts, right, but my, my background, I have uh, some master's work in organizational development and and John has a lot of background in this. And so we looked for some texts that would help us um, really frame organizational consultation skills for our students who, as you know, are hyper-focused on the individual, right, or the family. But this idea of, of um, business organizational consultation is really not there. So we, we chose some texts that were outside the comfort zone for some of our students, um, but offered an introduction. Um, how many of you know what appreciative inquiry is? Okay. Appreciative inquiry is um, the, the thin book of appreciative inquiry. That's one of the, the reasons we chose it. It's a very doable, easily learnable model of how to do an organizational consultation. So we didn't want to give our students another master's degree in organizational consultation in one course, but we wanted to show them that there's ways of thinking about consultation that are structured and that they can learn these structured approaches and give them a taste of that. So we gave them a broad, a broad uh, view of, of the field and then we gave them a model. Um, oh, oh yes, <laughs> lots of other readings and if you're interested in those, we're happy to share those with you. Um, and then we adopted a, let's see if I can click on this and get it to, um, yeah, we have some examples. Um, we have, we, um, we've adopted the APA competency for our program. So what we did um, is um, take those competencies and develop a rubric for evaluation of our students based on the APA competencies. So let's get into the practicalities of, of what we're doing. Um, we, our goal is to, uh, to support our students in understanding uh, the kind of classic approaches to consultation, but also to draw from the current literature. So as, as old as Gerald Kaplan in 1963 to Rodney Lohman in 2016 and a lot of readings in, in between. So we're trying to, to, to look at some basic models of consultation. As many of you may know, Kaplan, and his, uh, Kaplan was a psychiatrist with strong commitment to the community and to prevention, and he approached uh, four models of uh, consultation, client-centered case consultation, consultee-centered case consultation, what we are drawing on uh, today, program-centered administrative consultation, and consultee-centered administrative consultation. Program-centered administrative consultation, this type of consultation, the consultant is called by a consultee to help with current problems in the administration programs. The problems may relate to any aspect of the program, including the planning and administration of services and policies, governing the recruitment, training, and effective utilization of personnel. In response to the needs expressed by the consultees, and we'll come back to that consistently this afternoon, in response to the needs expressed by the consultees, the focus of the consultant is a specialized assessment of the current program or policy predicament and recommendations of a plan of action to resolve the difficulty. In many ways, the approach that we're proposing is similar to a classic uh, problem-solving approach. It also isn't that dissimilar to how we approach our clients. You begin by conducting an assessment. You, you work on developing the relationship. You identify areas you might want to focus on. You engage your client in deciding if those suggested areas of focus are the ones they would like to focus upon. You develop an intervention strategy. 
you implement your intervention strategy, and then you evaluate it. Uh, and so we, by, by choosing a simple model like Kaplan, we can help the students readily draw the connections between the kind of process and the sequence of activities that they're very familiar with in their clinical work and help them understand how, even though they are often very uh, reticent to think of themselves as having expertise that they can bring outside of the clinical office to an organization, uh, particularly if it's an organization, the type of organization where they may be uh, apprenticing themselves as practicum students, uh, it helps them to understand that this is really pretty simple and straightforward. Let's think about what, how I might transfer those skills I have out into another setting. So, uh, we'll talk some about some specific examples, but let's talk about the challenges that we face in implementing such, such a course. First of all, uh, the challenges for the academic department begin with deciding which faculty should be involved in providing this, this course. Uh, it's an interesting course. It's one that, that faculty, if they want to try something different, may volunteer to be part of. We found that it's really important to not uh, discourage that enthusiasm, but to make sure that you begin with, with faculty who have hands-on experience in consulting to organizations. Um, they, uh, there really is no substitute for having uh, been involved in this type of activity, even if it's in something of a limited way. What we are very open to doing is for faculty who would like to get involved in teaching this course, we've been, we are open to connecting them with faculty and shadow them as they go through a sequence of the course in hopes that they would then uh, be prepared to teach courses in the future. So the number one recommendation we have is choose the faculty for this type of course very wisely. You also are looking for faculty who are flexible. This, is, this uh, adds the complexity of not only dealing with your academic department and your students and your faculty colleagues, but also engaging with an entity outside the organization. An organization that you may know well, but you don't have really any control over. Keep in mind that one of the, the hallmarks of consultation is that you're engaging with the system, but you have no authority over what happens within that system. You are external to uh, accountable to, but not responsible for what happens in that organization. Um, and you also need to have faculty who are willing to allocate the time uh, to, to uh, add this level of complication to their schedule. <laughs> it, you're going beyond your academic department, your classrooms, your students, your basic uh, uh, activities within your training institution, and you need to be ready when the executive director of an agency calls or the um, or the client uh, representative you've been dealing with calls you and, and isn't available to talk to you till after their office hours. And so just somebody who's going to be ready to add a little bit of extra time. And then realistically, there may be the challenge to find space in your already very um, full curriculum to add this. I think the reality is because of the expectations of our accrediting bodies, but the expect expectations we have for ourselves, and frankly, the real opportunities our students will have, and as, as Kim said, already at least a third of our students on internship this year are being called on to engage in consultation situations within, uh, within organizations in the community where they're doing their internships. So there are job opportunities, career opportunities, it's demanded of us, and it's part of what we need to be doing, part of the competencies we need to be developing for our students. Challenges for the faculty. Um, you need to engage the right client organization to, to, uh, in, to, to extend this, uh, this um, consultation to. My own personal background, I had some uh, leg up in this, if you will. Uh, for most of my career, I've had both a part-time academic appointment at the Chicago School, and I've also been an executive leader within various community organizations. So frankly, I have some contacts and some relationships and have been able to get the door open a little easier. Uh, but, but frankly, I think that, that there are still plenty of opportunities to select the right organization. Look around you, look, at, look to the organization you're already engaged with. Look to the practicum sites that you're engaged with. Look to organizations where your, your alumni are employed. Um, there are even opportunities to look within your own institution. If there's a department within your institution that might welcome you and your students to, con to consult around a particular issue. So selecting the client organization is crucial. Uh, and doing it early. Don't wait to the beginning of your semester to identify that. Try to, to anticipate this need 
and engage the, uh, uh, with, with other organizations uh, and get them on board. Uh, manage the scope and time frame of the consultation engagement. We have a 13-week semester. So from, the, from introducing the topic of consultation to a finished product, we have 13 weeks. So clearly, we need to manage the scope and the expectations of our, of our consultee organization and anticipate how this is going to play out. Balancing the reality of what, you, what, what time frames you might need to impose with uh, the independence and self-determination you might want, wish your students to have as they plot out the best way to intervene with these organizations. You can't get around the reality of the constricted time frame and doing something worthwhile within a, within a very prescribed period of time. Uh, you need to manage the needs and wants of the client organization with the student's learning needs. You're, you're going out and inviting an organization to stretch themselves a little bit to be willing to welcome your students in. You're going to say, what, what's a problem you've been thinking about addressing? What are, what's a question that you're trying to answer within your own organization? How can we help you with that? But also, how can we define that in a way that has a narrow enough scope that my neophyte mm -hmm. consultant students are going to be able to bring value to your organization and that, they're, that they, they'll have a fairly short learning curve to be ready to go out and, and to, to meet with you. So, so balancing those expectations, something that's meaningful, worthwhile, doable within the time frame, and also uh, ambitious enough that you can engage your client organization, uh, but also something that's going to be doable. Like many things, it's really important to under-promise and over-deliver. To a, to a situation, as we've engaged now for about two years in a sequence of these courses, um, our client organizations have come back appreciative of and um, in many ways kind of uh, happily surprised at the, at the value of what they got from our experience. They were often in, uh, willing to engage with us because they wanted to support our students and to support this learning experience for our students. Uh, but they've been very pleased and satisfied with what we've been able to deliver. Managing the expectations, your expectations as a faculty member or administrator, the organization, the client organization's expectations, and the students. For the, in the case of the students, sometimes you need to kind of rev up their expectations because they're going to be concerned about, do I really have value to add to this organization? Then there's the challenge of measuring the individual student competence with a group-focused project. We'll talk some later about the various models we've been using and we've, we have uh, uh, used as the foundational document the uh, rubric that we're passing around that we'll, and that we'll have available for all of you um, and have used that in a variety of ways so that we have the faculty assessment of the student's performance, the student's evaluation of each other's performance as a group and the student's evaluation of their competence as an individual, including uh, where are they in terms of developing the competencies and what do they need to do and how do they plan on gaining, having the opportunities to gain the competency in those, in those areas. So for the students, the challenges for the students, thinking differently about who is my client. Kim mentioned that earlier. They're used to sitting in a clinical office, maybe a group room. When we say you're going to take your skills out to the field and you're going to add value to an organization, they don't always believe that they have much to offer in that regard. The other thing is, and this is a more, more or less a pleasant thing, mm -hmm. is we've done such a good job uh, through our training in ethics of, of, of admonishing the students not to practice beyond the, their, comp <laughs> their competency level. We need to say, well, yeah, try it out. I'm with you. I'm not, gonna, I'm not going to put you in a situation where you are going beyond what you're capable of doing. But I believe in you, and I believe in what you can offer, and we're going to do this together. And, and believe me, I'm not going to let you practice beyond your, your competency level. And so they get it eventually. But, but uh, often they're like, well, no, I, don't, I think that's not a pro. It's like, well, no, let's do it together. I will show you, I'll be right behind you, and I'm not going to ask you to do anything that would be unprofessional. Uh, it gives them an opportunity to develop their presentation skills. We'll talk some later, but often they have a pretty informal style. There's some generational issues here. We'll come back to that. But really developing a way of engaging others, uh, adapting their clinical interviewing skills in a different way, communicating psych psychological material to non-psychologists. They get so insulated that, uh, that they've, um, they've, some of their routine vocabulary in engaging others who are not psychologists or in the mental health field 
um, have atrophied a little bit. They need to remember <laughs> how to, to convert their ideas and to share them in a way that's going to be meaningful and understood by folks who are not necessarily clinically trained, in many cases are not clinically trained. Uh, and then pressing themselves to recognize that they do in fact have uh, something to offer their clients, their, their client organization. We said we'd offer three models. We've tried, we, we, this is a, a process of, of exploration as we have uh, offered this class now, I believe, for five semesters. Mm -hmm. um, one model, the first time we approached this, we t uh, and we tend to have, a cl have a classes of 12 to 16 or 17 for this level of course. It's offered to our fourth year students. Um, sometimes it's a time when they're also preparing their internship materials, so it's a busy time. They're finishing their dissertations, they're engaging in the preparation for internship, and that, then we ask them to get engaged in this, which takes them out of the classroom and can be a little bit unsettling. Um, so often we've divided the cl those, that class of 12 to 16 into work teams. The first time out, we invited these teams to work independently in assessing a client organization's needs and developing a response to that client organization. Sort of a friendly competition among teams working independently within the class. Uh, the second model that we've uh, tried is have the entire class working together collaboratively on addressing the same uh, problem or issue within the organization, um, but then perhaps subdividing some of the activities in each, each cluster within the class specializing in accomplishing a particular task. And this, this is the model we'll be, uh, we'll be talking about a little bit more about in a few minutes. Then we've added another dimension. Our, our uh, in program now requires a f every, all of our first year students to uh, be engaged in a research clerkship. It's a one hour course, uh, over uh, one, hour, one hour course credit in each of two semesters during their first year. They attach themselves to a faculty member and, and work together with that faculty member in accomplishing some research activity that gives them some beginning uh, skills in collaborating with faculty and also in, um, in uh, learning more about the research, research methodology. This year uh, we've added to model two uh, attaching a cohort of three of our research clerks to one of these classes to uh, apprentice themselves to fourth year students uh, and to also um, allow the fourth-year students to be mentors in this enterprise of those first-year students. It also allows us to introduce very early in a student's program the competency of, of consultation. At the end of the day, the approach that we've used is a combination of what's the problem that an organization wishes to address and also kind of the, the climate or the culture or the personality of the students in a particular course in a particular semester. So in some semesters, it's been very effective to do the kind of divide and compete model. Uh, in other semesters, we've, uh, it, they've really wanted to collaborate. And what I've done a couple of times most recently is give the students um, some choice on that and describe the pros and cons and, and see what direction they want to go. Uh, one of the first examples we have is a consultation one of our colleagues, Dr. Dr. Rachel Pizor, did with a community mental health organization that was building on the success of an intervention um, with uh, a, a, a federally qualified health center in one community based on the success they had in moving mental health and substance abuse services into the FQHC. Um, they were invited to do something similar in another community. They knew that there were many things that they could transfer directly from one experience to another but they engaged our students in helping them assess and determine how can we build on what we're doing successfully in one community, but how can we incorporate the particular characteristics of this other community in designing how we're going to um, extend uh, mental health and, and addiction services into this other setting? What processes can stay the same? What needs to be modified or changed? How can they utilize current resources? What additional resources might be needed? Our students did this with our faculty in 13 weeks. Right. Um, other examples of the three models. Um, with the same community mental health center, another group of students assisted them in, in taking a fresh look at 
um, how they approached quality improvement within the organization. In that model, the students, uh, together, all of the students interviewed the key community mental health center leaders, uh, did, a, did site visits to visit the, the, the site itself, uh, and then three teams independently came up with a proposal to make to the Community Mental Health Center what they, how they might want to approach um, what, what, they, uh, what, what they might do to improve quality, to do quality improvement. Um, we're going to start passing around uh, some examples of the power, final PowerPoints that students presented. Again, these are just for, your, for examples of the kinds of end product the students produced. Uh, one of them in there is labeled pillars. That's, the, that's several of the proposals that came back and were, pre, um, were presented similar to a competition uh, for ad agency pitching, right. a, pitching a client. Right. Here's, a, here's what we, 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 t we assessed your situation. Here's what we think is important. Here's what we would recommend. Um, and they presented those independently and did not hear each other's pitches uh, to the client, but then we had an extensive discussion after the fact so that everyone benefited from the three different perspectives that the three groups of students uh, took to that. Um, I'm a board member of NAMI, of our statewide NAMI, National Alliance on Mental Illness uh, chapter. Our organization faced a major uh, cut in funds uh, and a need to reorganize. So a year ago this fall, um, we uh, uh, the students engaged the statewide organization and um, together came in with some recommendations on how the organization uh, might um, retrench and yet keep the highest, uh, uh, the, the, the features that were the highest priority for the membership across the state. In doing that, the students interviewed leaders, assessed the situation, attended the statewide conference and just kind of did participant observation at a statewide conference. They then conducted key informant interviews of uh, affiliate leaders from around the state. They did about 30 key informant interviews, and they did an online survey. And as a result of all that, again, uh, sharing the responsibility among the class, they came up with a uh, final proposal. That, that's uh, one of the brightly colored uh, PowerPoints that's going around as an example. Uh, and then finally, the example I'll go into the most depth on in, in our limited time is a recently completed consultation to a Department of Local Government in conducting a community needs assessment. So the, um, uh, in Illinois, there's a, a piece of legislation that allows agencies of local government, either counties or townships, and townships are a subcategory of, um, of uh, government smaller than a county but larger than a town. Um, townships or counties, uh, the folks who live in those communities can um, pass a referendum to decide to raise their own taxes to support mental health and addiction services. Um, I happen to serve as a consultant to a township in the western suburbs of, of Chicago, uh, a township that has four, four small communities. Uh, it's a board that raises only $500,000 to support mental health services, which is um, sounds like a lot of money, but given the, the needs in the community, they, needed to, they need to decide intentionally how to spend those funds. This is a board that wants to make sure that all of their okay. funds go toward the provision of services. They, they want to spend the least amount possible on infrastructure kinds of things. They don't have an office. They don't have a staff. I function one day a month as their executive director to help them with their grant applications and, and to staff their meetings. Part of the legislation requires that each of these, these mental health boards conducts a community needs assessment on some regular basis. As Kim mentioned earlier, when they talk to their colleagues from other organizations, one, one township spent $75,000 to engage a major university to do this. Another one spent $10,000 to, to do kind of a quick and dirty needs assessment, but even then they were committing $10,000. Um, I propose to them, if you're willing to, to start small and to uh, support our graduate students, we'll come out and we'll conduct a community needs assessment as a start. It'll, it'll be modest. It'll be limited, and it's going to be based on the, on the emerging expertise of our graduate students. They jumped at the idea. So we did that by... Um, by uh, through a, a, a process that that followed that Kaplan model of 
conduct, a, conduct an assessment, make a proposal to your client, understand if that's, if that's acceptable to the client, implement it, evaluate it, provide the results, see where you go from here. So I made this arrangement before the beginning of the semester. The first week of the semester, we had the president of the board attend the class and say, here's who we are, here's what we need. What do you all think you could do? Um, they were a little uh, startled by that <laughs> opportunity, uh, but, but got past that and they, and they immediately began using very fine interviewing skills sitting there in the classroom understanding from the perspective of this mental health board director who's a, an accountant. He's about as far from being psychologically minded as, as a lay person might be. And so he wasn't using their language and he, he needed them to, to clarify what they, what they meant when they were asking particular questions. But they collected data from him about what they were interested in. The board wanted to know, are we, are we when, when we contract for mental health services in our community, are we buying the things that our neighbors need? What are the priorities? What's, how is our community different now than it was 10 years ago? We don't know. We don't have any resources to know that. What should we be doing in the future? Everybody's short on money. How should we be spending our funds? So they conducted that, that uh, initial interview. Then some of the students went out and sat and observed the, very, the, the monthly uh, meetings of the mental health board and then spent time afterwards talking to the board members informally. Um, they decided that the strategy that they wanted to use was to, to do a number of things. They wanted to help the organization collect demographics on their community. They delegated that to the research clerks, to the first year students. They said, first years, we're gonna support you in this, but you go out and find out everything you can find out from census data, from the uh, Department of Public Health, every other resource. They then decided that they wanted to uh, do key informant interviews, and so they invited the mental health board to list who are the key leaders in your community. They wanted to do a survey. They developed a, a, a survey that was launched through SurveyMonkey uh, that thus far has over 200 responses. And it was important as they talked to their client organization. The client organization said, we want to know what the average person on the street um, knows about what we do as a mental health board and we want to know what's important to them. We want to hear the voice not of the professionals and the school superintendent, that's all important, but we just want to hear from ordinary folks. So the students conducted a, com a community needs assessment on a Saturday morning. Um, they went out, they, it was not particularly well attended, there were about a dozen folks there, but it was a start. And then based on that, there been, there's been some follow-up. So they, um, uh, they uh, also along the way developed a brochure. One, one student was very good at um, at some graphic design, and so she took the information and helped them develop a brochure that cost absolutely cost nothing. I'm sitting here with Tim Heilenbach. He's uh, the chair of the mental health board here in Riverside. So, Tim, why don't you just talk a little bit about kind of how you got to this position and what your experiences have been with the Chicago School and Dr. Shisitsky? Well, Dr. Sh John is our <laughs> is our uh, consultant here. Yep. And uh, I came on board about the same time as, as John did. I think John was here maybe about six months before, so it's been about three years. Um, he immediately took me out one Saturday morning. We went right over here to the bakery in town here, and he went over what the mental health board does. I was asked to join the mental health board uh, because they needed someone to, to fill the position. Um, I have no education on it, so this is basically a, an education for me, but I've turned into really enjoying it. My interaction with the students here uh, of, your, of your class has been nothing but fantastic. Uh, it, it, it's great to see somebody that wants to do something for the community. Mental health is, is you know, it always goes, seems to go to the back burner. Any, any type of mental health problems, whether it be developmental or, or drug abuse, it, well, we don't really want to talk about that. Let's put it to the back. We want to bring that towards the front. And, and the students that I see uh, are just unbelievably, you know, the ideas that came out at that meeting that I attended yeah. just floored me. I, I, I told John on the way out, I said, man, these guys are, they, they know what they're doing. And, and it's great to see. 
importance of the visit to the field, make sure you get your students out of your school, out to the organizations. Um, teaching the students a formal style of communicating with their clients, their generational issues. Um, very informal communication. Um, while they might be very good at formal presentations around clinical cases, in speaking to a lay audience, there's an informality that kicked in. I, with every class I've had to say, and I didn't learn, I didn't know this the first time out until we were in our final presentation, don't refer to these folks as you guys. Um, yeah. to, a, to, a per, to a group, you guys should do this, you guys should do this. Like, I'm sorry, let's think about how to be a little more formal and professional in your presentation. Um, being ready to adjust to logistical issues that arise within the client organization. There's so much of this that was, I mean, when you're in, in your classroom, you're in control. When you engage the community, you lose a substantial amount of control. Uh, one of the other groups that did consultation to the statewide NAMI organization was fully prepared to launch the key informant interviews. All these, all the organization, all the key informants had been assigned, the questions were developed, but as we promised, we needed to get the, the final okay from the board president that, that he had consulted with the board and that they were fine with who we were going to contact and what questions were going to be answered. In the middle of this, the board president had a knee replacement uh, operation. And although he bounced back fairly quickly, he was under substantial medication for a while. And when I'd call him and say, you know, I'm just not thinking clearly. Let me get back to you in a few days. Let me get back. So we lost almost two weeks as we were waiting for the final green light from our client. The students were great. This was pushing up into their, their final exam period, their internship application period. Uh, but they were, at that point, highly invested in the process, and they agreed to just keep doing the key informant interviews. Went well past the finals period, but well, um, almost up to, uh, to uh, the December holidays, and even a couple of interviews happened in early January. The students wanted to see this through. But we lost control. We, we, couldn't, we didn't get it all wrapped up in the, in the semester because we waited for uh, the, the representative of the, of the organization to be prepared to, uh, to give us the green light. Um, opportunities to introduce appreciative inquiry, as we talked about, and opportunities to address social justice and diversity issues in real life situations. One of the things that came out of the most recent consultation to the Community Mental Health Board were very specific recommendations based on what the students learned about demographics. They noted in particular the shift and, and the increase in the number of households where uh, English was not the first language spoken by the, by the adults in the household. Uh, also, the uh, recognition of the increased number of single parent households. So they, they zeroed in on that and began to say, here's some kinds of things you might want to think about, how you might want to uh, think about the best way to provide services, knowing these things about what's new in your community in the last 10 years. We do all of this as one half of the deliverables of a two hour, one semester class. So we alternate depending, I mean, we get them started on the consultation activities, then we spend several weeks teaching on teaching supervision. There's some supervision, rela supervision related um, assignments and simulations. Uh, we pack a lot into that two hour course. Yeah, we, we've, uh uh, the students' um, commentary on this is, I didn't think I was going to make it through, but boy, was this useful. So we're really, you know, we're really trying to figure out ways to improve our uh, supervision competency model as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We'll post all of these up on the website.